And now we will have Patrick McDonald. And Pat is an associate professor in the Department of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. His research and teaching interests lie at the intersection of a number of fields, including international relations theory, international security, political economy, and diplomatic history. He is currently working on two projects, one which argues that there is no democratic peace among states, and another which compares the international political consequences of the Great Depression with that of the Great Recession of 2008. Thank you. Well, I too would like to thank our hosts for this opportunity. We had a nice visit at dinner, and it's always it's good to go back and, and re-examine and think about ideas and arguments and refine them ahead. An interesting conversation with myself on the plane today, rethinking some of these ideas and, and looking at new explanations and things that I missed. Um, First, let me just start with the, the kind of motivation behind my project. I should say the one-liner from my story is that capitalism causes peace. Um, and I think well, a lot of the differences that emerges among the three of us stem from differences in how we define capitalism. And I'll talk more about how I do that in a second. But I came to this project um, thinking of it as a critique of the democratic peace. I'm very skeptical of the democratic peace here. And this is, this is a quote from John Owen reviewing a book um, that was critical of um, the claim that democracy uh, promotes peace and linking it to the larger American policy debates um, during the Bush administration. Um, and pointing at what the Owen piece was doing is, is highlighting this, what appeared to be an intimate connection between the science and, and policy in these debates matter. Um, you know, we've moved largely to a consensus, I think, in the field that democracy promotes peace. Um, what I was doing in this book was trying to raise some skepticism. And, um, and I really advanced um, two central claims. One is that capitalism promotes peace. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the difference across some of us in terms of how we define capitalism, I define it in terms really of two institutional attributes. Um, I'm drawing my definitions from work by comparative um, economists, in particular Janos Kornai. Um, and I should say, too, that the definition the definitional aspect is one that generates controversy. I know in my tenure, um, the conversation for me at tenure um, stemmed partly on this difference. I had some colleagues who said he doesn't know how to define capitalism. He's ignoring a lot of literature. Um, I thought it was a relative safe, relative safe term because I was uh, defining it in terms of how economists do. But anyway, the definitions are the relative predominance of private property and economy. And I use this as uh, for my, this definition drives the empirical analysis. Um, so it's the relative predominance of private property and the allocation of scarce resources via competitive markets. So those two key institutional attributes are linked to peace. Um, my temporal domain is about the last 150 years. Um, the second argument is that the capitalist peace has historically been much stronger than the democratic peace. Um, in this book, I couldn't do away with the democratic peace. Um, my thinking has changed completely. I'm not pretty confident I can't do away with it. Um, but I had to contain myself a little bit in this book and just make it one an argument in terms of the relative strength. Um, the key policy implication that I, that I pull out of this is that US grand strategy should be geared more towards promoting economic liberalization than, than political liberalization. So let me give you kind of five sets of um, explanations or theoretical relationships that help to account for why it is that I think capitalism promotes peace. Um, two are gonna focus on this relative distribution between private and public property. Um, in, the, in the domestic economy. And three are going to focus on competitive markets and structure competitive markets. And the way I usually, what I use to proxy or measure competitive markets is an economy's integration in the broader global economy. To what extent do you, do you regulate international trade? And economists talk about how this is important because this is a device to import competition into your domestic economy. If you have domestic monopolies, you open up your border, uh, borders to international trade, cut tariffs. What happens is the monopolies tend to get competed out of business by foreign competition. So five mechanisms to on this relative distribution between private and public property. Um, the first thing important, you did, important here is in terms of, we think about government providing public goods, um, whether it's building up the military, um, social welfare spending, public goods spending, at all, it has to generate these resources. It has to come up with the means to pay for it. 
um, it engages in a bargaining process with society to come up with these resources. And the nature of this bargaining is critical for society's capacity to constrain the state and shape its foreign policy. And what's unique in economies that are predominated or that where they're dominated by public ownership of the means of production is that governments don't have to engage in this bargaining with society to generate the resources to implement their public policy. This generates a tremendous amount of political autonomy for governments. And it reduces their costs, their political costs, of paying for policies that can be costly to broader society like war. And so I talk about this in terms of the growth of public property in the domestic economy creates political insulation. Um, and it reduces the short and medium, medium um, domestic costs associated with going to war because the state doesn't have to negotiate with society to build up the military to say engage in conflict. You can pay off um, groups that are on the fence between wanting to support war and wanting to oppose war. Um, and this is really, the, the logic here is, is derived from the, the classical story about the rise of um, democracy in, in England in the 17th century. Um, so the key thing here is public property creates domestic political insulation for the government and it, as a consequence reduces the political costs for going to war. Um, so that's a story about the domestic politics of, of war and how you sustain support. There's a, there's a second mechanism that's intimately tied to the distribution of power between states and how it is that access to large quantities of public property enable the government to sustain arms races that shift the distribution of military power that make other countries nervous and generate war as a result. And here again, we want to think about the bargaining process that emerges between government and society um, in terms of how do we get resources from the private sector into the, into the public sector, and in particular into the military sector. Um, by freeing the government from continually renegotiating the basic tax contract with society, governments, large quantities of public property, enable the government to run long arms races. Um, and we can think about the broader international political co um, complications that are associated with this. If we imagine a state that doesn't have lots of public property and the types of calculations that it has to make in an intensely conflictual situation. Um, a really good example of this logic is um, President Eisenhower in the summer of 1953. He comes into office, he commissions a, a, a pretty large re-examination of American grand strategy. Um, this is called Project Solarium. Um, and the conclusions and the arguments stem critically on the political cost that the United States would pay to sustain the long run arms race with the Soviet Union. He said the only way we can sustain the arms race because they own all the means of production, it's not costly for them, it's not politically costly for them um, to, to continue to run this arms race is we're going to have to become more like the Soviet. We're going to have to take over um, our domestic economy. We're going to have to impose price quotas. Um, we're going to have to interfere in markets. We're going to have to take over industry. We're going to have to intervene in, in lending market and interest rate markets. Um, and he says, so we have a choice. We can basically go to war now um, or perpetually make concessions to the Soviet Union because we can't stop the long-term shift in the distribution of power. Well, Eisenhower had a technological out of this that solved this fiscal contract dilemma, and that was nuclear weapons. And there's this famous exchange between him and Dulles in September of 1953, where Dulles says, maybe we should go, maybe we should launch, um, we should go to war, launch nuclear weapons to avoid these economic costs. Um, and, but the, the problem here was how control of the means of production in the Soviet Union enabled them to start an arms race, sustain it, and the U.S. couldn't keep up. And so the U.S. faced a long period, potentially, where they would successfully, or successively, I should say, um, make concessions to, to the Soviet Union throughout, um, um, throughout the world. And so the dynamic here is when you have a country that has lots of public property, they can start and sustain arms races, and they tend to become targets um, in preventive war. In the book, I talk a lot about how Russia, this, I think this explains a lot of the, the strategic logic between the German, behind the German decision for war in 1914. They were running an arms race with, at that time, Russia, which was heavily dependent 
on vodka monopoly and state ownership of the railways. What this did was insulate the Russian government from having to renegotiate the back basic tax contract. They didn't have to raise income taxes. So they're running an arms race that the rest of Western Europe can't keep up. So German calculations in 1914 are, the archives are littered with references to talking about what do we do in 1917 when Russia completes its next round of rearmament. We don't have enough money. Um, the other three mechanisms and the other three stories about how this the capitalism promotes peace um, are linked to the argument, are linked to the structure of markets. And here, what I'm going to argue is that free trade promotes peace. And I differ from a lot of the literature that has predominantly focused on just looking at aggregate trade flows. And for me, what's critical is the level of regulation in the domestic economy and how the state regulates um, trade coming in and out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, tariff barriers insulate domestic industry from international competition. So the elimination of these barriers becomes a device to import um, competition. And it's free trade that drives peace. And this is a manifestation of a larger um, capitalist piece. Um, we skip this one to get to the three sets of mechanisms. How can we think about domestic politics and, uh, and the decision making of, of capitalists or groups that benefit from com competitive markets from groups that don't? Um, first, so we should think in terms of what groups gain from war. And this is in part a standard opportunity, or I should say gain from peace, and this is a standard opportunity cost argument, is that groups that benefit from open markets tend to oppose policies that could contract or close markets. And war is a classic example of this. War breaks out, states tend to embargo and halt trade with everybody else. So we have to ask what groups gain from free trade, what groups hurt hurt from free trade. So we can think about consumers as, as being proponents for peace as critical lobbying forces. And the trade increases their real income by reducing the price of, of consumption goods. The problem, though, is, I guess that means hurry up. <laughs> the problem is that consumers are um, So I want to talk about the conflict within society over um, globalization and how that shapes preferences with respect to war and peace, and then talk about how states um, sell regulation to build support coalitions to go to war. Um, so consumers as a group um, tend to support free trade, and as a consequence have strong economic incentives to oppose policies for war because they interrupt um, trade. The thing is, consumers are subject to the collective action problem, and are often poor um, advocates, or I should say they're effective Public policy making is really strong. Um, exporters that are competitive in open international markets um, tend to support peace. Why? Because trade, non violent conflict resolution, creates new market opportunities for them. More importantly, they don't rely, they don't have any of the incentives to pay costs associated with war um, because they get um, access to new markets through peaceful means. Right? And we can contrast groups, let's think about um, exporters that are competitive in open international markets, with, say, protected sectors that historically have tended to favor um, imperialism. And they favor imperialism because the carving out of these protected zones of export or cheap inputs to production um, depend on government regulation and government, government insulation. And so these groups that are non competitive in international markets that are more willing to pay lobbying costs associated, or pay lobbying costs to the state to, in a sense, capture state policy to promote um, conflict along the lines of the classic materialist argument. Um, the third story that I want to tell here is um, a story about how government regulation can provide a means for the state to, in a sense, capture society and drag society along into an aggressive foreign policy that they might not otherwise support. Um, and they can do that by intervening in the domestic economy. The classic story here is, is Belle Polypique in Germany at the end of the 19th century, in which the German state essentially constructs a coalition in support of naval, naval construction, um, and a much more aggressive foreign policy by intervening in agricultural markets, raising tariffs, to get the support of the Prussian landowners. And then the money from the tariffs 
was then used to buy battleships, which gave guaranteed contracts to the shipbuilding industry. And so it constructs the Iron and Rye Coalition through its capacity to intervene and regulate domestic market. Um, so let me give you a summary of the key statistical results um, in the project. Um, the key empirical results. The first thing is the connection between high, um, private property and fees. Higher quantities of private property and domestic economy reduce the likelihood that governments initiate and are targeted in military conflicts. This holds across a number of research um, designs. Um, free trade is linked to peace. Um, a reduction in tariff barriers is, tends to be associated with the reduction in participation in military conflict. This holds across both eras of globalization, an era dating from the middle of the 19th century to 1914, and then during the Cold War period. Um, Capitalist peace is much stronger than the democratic peace. The democratic peace doesn't emerge until after World War One. Capitalist peace exists before World War One. Um, before World War One, democratic states are much more likely to engage um, in conflict than, than, than autocratic states. In the 20th century, the democratic peace only holds among capitalist states. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about World War One. I. I won't. Um, let me just say. I can have 30 seconds. Oh, well, my time's up. Uh, <laughs> all right, 30 seconds in terms of um, one of the takeaway points and, and kind of rethinking the broader project. One case that I missed, I should have had an extensive discussion of the interwar period um, and the German economy, and this is where Rafi and I would, um, would disagree. Um, this was not a capitalist economy. Um, the state took this economy over in 1933. In fact, the the arms program that Germany launches in 1933 is timed to the day to um, expropriation of foreign assets. Uh, basically, Germany said, we're not going to pay any reparations, we're not going to pay any, lo any loans, any borrowing that we've done in the last 15 years to the day, to the decision to rearm. Um, I think that we need to think in terms of the sustainability of capitalism. Capitalism promotes peace, but as we see in 1929, but not in 2008, capitalism can eat itself um, and destroy itself. And what can happen then if capitalism eats itself, it creates opportunities for massive state intervention in the domestic economy, and that's a really bad thing. Um, and the debts tend to be associated with much higher levels um, of conflict. I will leave the story there, but I look forward to um, questions in the conversation.